Hello, my name is Rita Valenti, and I am the host of the Public Health Pulse podcast series. We are so happy to be interviewing Cara Page, Edgar Rivera Colon, Rob Wallace, scientist extraordinaire, Lara Germanis, physician and author of the People CDC External Pandemic Review, Dr. Sal Sandoval, practicing public health in the Valley of Southern California, John V. Devashi, medical student, and Tamika Middleton, who brings it all home as the managing director of the Women's March with We Can't Reform Our Way Out of This. Welcome to the exciting Public Health Pulse podcast series. <laughs> Let me let me let me start by thanking you, Sal, uh, for being a part of the Public Health Pulse podcast series. We're we're really excited to have you here. And um, before uh, I share sort of a more formal introduction of you, I wanted to um, share a little bit from a uh, an article that you recently wrote for the Tribuno del Pueblo. Uh, the article was called Declaring the Pandemic Over Will Hurt Families. And I want to just read a little, little clip from that oh. article. Um, sure. Update. On April 1st, states across the United States will start the process of stripping Medicaid coverage from millions of people as pandemic-related protections lapse that that's part of a broader unraveling of a safety net that was built to help families withstand the public health crisis and resulting economic turmoil. All of this is happening despite strong evidence accumulated during the pandemic that having access to health care and food security benefits the most vulnerable and saves lives. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Sal. And and for our audience that uh, may not know you, uh, Dr. Sal Sandoval has been involved in the rural in uh, rural San Joaquin Valley of California for most of his life. First, as a family medicine physician, working with Spanish-speaking people, farm workers, food processing workers, all the rural poor and the homeless. For over three years, he's been a public health doctor during the COVID-19 pandemic. He has served on the National Advisory Council for Migrant Health and is on the editorial board of the Tribuno del Pueblo, writing extensively for a public health and medical care system that serves everyone. Welcome, Sal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you got anything to add to your... Uh, illustrious bi uh, biography <laughs> well <clears throat> it's uh, it's a, been a life journey i i was born in sacramento but uh, i'm about two hours uh, away in the central valley mm. and i kidnapped my wife from uh, los angeles she's a she was a city slicker uh, <laughs> but she, but she and i have i think uh, had an impact on this community that uh, you know <clears throat> was gonna uh, last longer than us i think that's right. And I want to get right into that because um, because you have been a practicing physician for a long time and you have deep, deep community roots. Uh, and specifically for the last three years, you've been a public health doctor in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and I think you were the only public health doctor that uh, succeeded in intervening to force the closure of a foster farms facility. I believe that's a poultry processing facility in California that was experiencing a deadly COVID-19 outbreak. Um, I wonder if you could share that story a little bit and how it was so emblematic that uh, food processing workers were uh, being treated as both essential and disposable at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, it's an important point. Um, I, I had been a health officer for about five months. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, <clears throat> we were getting, uh, actually, we had done a tour of the uh, plant, and I, I was impressed by the fact that they had a veterinarian checking for avian flu, but they had no occupational medicine doctor, and they had over 5,000 employees. Wow. Um, we started getting uh, reports of cases of COVID. And at that time, this is way before any 
vaccines or treatment uh, were available. And, and the testing was also a little difficult to, to get uh, at that time. Right. But we we started getting cases and we uh, were asking, requesting that they do testing. Uh, and we wanted them to do serial testing where they test, uh, you know, one week and then they test them again. Uh, but they didn't. They just did uh, tests in, in different departments. And uh, but even with that, we found that they had the highest uh, reported cases in the state, you know, and, and, and partly is because they have all these people working in crowded conditions. When we did the tour of the plant, what we saw when, one of the problems was that they had an older workforce. And then also when they went into the break room, they were taking off their masks and they're chatting in front of the microwave while they're waiting for their food to get warmed up. Mm -hmm. So we started seeing some cases of, uh, of hospitalizations and deaths, but the problem was it was very difficult to get the information. Our, our uh, cross-county uh, communications are very poor. We would find out like a month later, someone was in the intensive care uh, or that had died. And we, with the reports, we were we started meeting with them pretty regularly, and and uh, uh, what was very really disturbing, I knew of two deaths in in the plant. We found out there were seven deaths because they had buried within the uh, uh, recovered uh, category, like three hundred recovered. Uh, there were five additional deaths, so that was part. I mean, that was worrisome, but I think partly also because the uh, information transfer was very slow. So uh, at that point, I think the fact that they weren't doing the testing uh, the way we were recommending, they were stalling, and they were kind of trying to apply political pressure on us to back off on them from the state. Uh, <clears throat> I talked to, to our uh, director of about uh, uh, that we might have to to consider closing the plant. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened there was we were we were consulting with people from the state, uh, occupational health specialists, and uh, we were running to buy them. But when when I found out about that uh, those hidden figures of uh, of the deaths. I think I, we started saying, you know, that this something worrisome is happening here. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to our director about, uh, you know, considering closing the place, doing a deep clean, uh, testing everybody when they went back in and then testing them again when they came out. And she, she got me to hold off. But actually, it was good that she got me to hold off because um, I tell I kid around with people that, uh, she had connections with the Department of Justice in, in Sacramento and then also with the State Health Department. So we uh, struggled to get them on board, but we finally did. Uh, uh, so I, I told people that we were negotiating with this billion-dollar corporation with uh, Big Brother and Big Sister waiting in the wings. Uh, so mm. I was kind of glad that we delayed because, you know, I was a, a raw, brand-new uh, health officer in this situation that uh you know i think th people weren't able to <laughs> they, they couldn't comprehend it basically but uh <clears throat> we had a very yeah. difficult situation where we we uh started getting political pressure actually from elected officials at the state level uh uh con congressperson uh to 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 not close them to just uh force them to do more testing. And, and uh, uh, in consultation with our specialists at the occupational health uh, branch, I think uh, we we really saw that it was past that. You know, you ha we had to do something more drastic. And about that time, there had been uh, a case in the Midwest where uh, there was a huge outbreak in a meatpacking plant. It wasn't poultry like in Foster Farms, but there were deaths and there were a large number of, uh, of, of hospitalized persons, also immigrants and poor people, African-American, Asian. Um, but the health department there 
uh, was reluctant to do anything, but a Republican sheriff stepped in and closed the place. So we've kind of followed that example. Uh, we even got uh, thrown up against uh, Trump's uh, USDA uh, person, uh, Secretary of Agriculture, and she squeezed two days uh, delay on the closure because we were going to close it on a Thursday. So I started getting flack. People were getting attacked from right and from left and, and from up and down uh, about closing it. And the uh, lead attorney with the Department of Justice started saying, well, I, I don't know if Dr. Sandoval is going to hold up to the pressure. Mm. And, and I told her, well, basic, I told her basically, you know, I'll, I'll take responsibility for the deaths uh, uh, in the last two days of the extension. After that, it's on foster farms. And uh, we went through hell with, uh, with meeting with the foster farms people, having to deal with the uh, people at the federal and the state level and the local level that were opposed to it. But I think what hap- helped is we were united. Uh, we had uh, a director and uh, epidemiologists uh, that, that could back me up. Mm-hmm. So we actually at the uh, at the eleventh hour we got a call. I got a call at home from the uh, <clears throat> the the CEO of Foster Farms, and he wanted to make a deal. Oh. And I was told, "Don't do that," you know, because if you do something like that, they'll just twist around what you said. So I, I told him, "We'll send it to the office. We're going to have a, a follow up meeting with the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture." which never happened. So then I started thinking, well, they never sent me an email about what their proposal was. We got uh, we got nixed by the Secretary of Agriculture, so we're, we're, we're gonna go ahead and do it. But then I get another call. And this time they had a proposal, I ran it by the consultants, and it, was, it worked. We, instead of closing them two weeks, we closed them one week, but we had testing done at three days. So uh, initially, and then at uh, three days, and uh, we closed them for a week. They managed to clean up the problem. And after that, we were monitoring them very closely. One of the recommendations was they, they have an occupational health doctor there to deal with the employees. I mean, uh, besides a veterinarian, uh, to have someone that actually addressed uh, ma- making sure people were they were they were out sick, uh, weren't hospitalized, or or, or worse, uh, and they ended up actually being our our model. I mean, they had a better uh, control of the situation. Less the the case positivity rate was way lower in the plant than on the outside community that fed workers into it. So that's that's what could happen if things work right. We never, I think we would have been scared if we knew the situation because we actually it ended up that we were the only county in the whole country that where the health department actually was successful in closing down a meatpacking plant. You know, it's it just just to sort of put some more context in this too. I mean, it, it's, it shows so many things. It shows one, the, the weakness of a public health infrastructure on on the one hand going into the pandemic, right? It also shows that the workers that were, you know, in the plant were already among the most vulnerable yeah. uh, 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 members of our of our big working class yeah. uh, as as essential workers, and it also shows the kind of struggle that you had to go through and those that were aligned with you in public health to do the right thing, you know, to, to sort of, you know, confront a corporation that was more concerned with getting the product Mm -hmm. out and making the money than protecting the workers that were producing that. Um, Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of lessons within that. Yeah, a lot of lessons, <laughs> and I think it uh, it was confusing for people because we we have a very conservative county, 
Mm. And our uh, county council had actually almost uh, tripped us up in the beginning. He had said, well, the state's never going to work with you. Forget, you know, working with big government. I mean, they're just going to leave a uh, little Merced to fight this big corporation. And so I emailed one of the consultants. And I told her, I feel let down. You know, you guys said you guys were going to back me up. And then she called me. And and she said, no, he's interpreting it the way he wants. Mm -hmm. So by a, a, a skin skin of our teeth, we 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 put it through, but it was being blocked at so many levels. And and even even in the aftermath, I wasn't clear to people what was happening. We were getting bombarded with people saying, "Well, why did you only keep them closed one week? Why did you know? Uh, you know, we were getting people didn't understand the situation." It wasn't until we were on uh, uh, Good Morning America that I think the people found out the extent of what had happened. I mean, well, you it know, was big. Yeah, I mean, uh, which speaks to, uh, you know, sort of another part of this, because I, I would venture to say that there were probably other public health officials around the country that might have wanted to do something similar yeah. in the communities that they were in. But, you know, th sort of throughout the pandemic, public health workers and public health officers that spoke, and I think these are your words, inconvenient truths yeah. have faced, you know, threats, intimidation, firings forced resignations. And, you know, I think that's that reality is important to share with people. Um, what what does it really mean uh, for uh, the science of public health to keep getting thrown under the bus, right? Mm -hmm. People can't actually implement what they know to be the right thing to do. And maybe I, I know you've done some some research into this, you know, about yeah. what happened to so many public health uh, officers. And yeah, it, uh, in the state of California, which is probably a little better off than a lot of other states, especially like in, in the South, I know it's even worse. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. uh, in in one of the, the so-called better uh, situation states, we had 18 uh, health officers that were uh, forced to leave uh or or you know one one was her life was threatened in orange county and she was uh picketed at her home and she she resigned and and uh so there was a huge exodus of people from public health because public health used to be kind of they, some people would joke joke about it it's a boring place to work but you know they they'd come in it was sure wasn't boring than that during that time but uh it was very hectic and uh uh, there was there was a lot of uh, antagonism and and it was the pandemic became very political and, right. and um, mm. uh, we had people on the one hand saying well you know uh, uh, the deaths of people that's a that's a, a, a cost of doing business mm. Mm. you know and and that's kind of disgusting you know to hear hear that kind of uh, of uh, of an assessment, mm -hmm. but I think what what helped in, happened in my situation since I had a history in this county. If people knew me; it was harder to attack me. But I was attacked, you know. In um, uh, but but I think what uh, as the uh, pandemic developed, and th there's a lot of lot of uh, stages to it. But I think when once the you know. The masking issue became very contentious. The vaccination issue became very contentious. And it was made a political football, actually, by both Democrats and and uh, their opposition. Mm -hmm. Is um, There was one school where they were going to pass. See, the governor was going to have a mandate that everybody had to be vaccinated against COVID to go into the schools. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there, were, there was a resolution yeah, at one of the local schools uh, opposing that. And uh, it was a political issue. At the same time, there were truckers going to Sacramento, you know, protesting uh, the mandates and all that kind of stuff. And I, I went to the school board. I, I consulted with the director, you know, first. And then she, she kind of said, yeah, I, I, you should. Because uh, the message was going to be don't 
you know, immunizations aren't necessary. You now, uh, problems over or kids don't get affected, which wasn't true. The, so I went and I got attacked by, I mean, the, I, I, the fact that I, I threw a monkey wrench into the plan to, to, with the resolution. So, uh, it look, could, looks could kill the author of that would have killed me. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, what happened was the, uh, new CEO or CAO, uh, said I was getting political because I was talking about, uh, this resolution would, would, would uh, discourage people getting immunized. And we had one of the lowest immunization rates in the state, you know, in, in Merced County. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were th- a couple more meetings, but eventually they. What happened was my contract as a health officer ex- uh, was going to expire. I had applied for the permanent position, and then they went without a health officer, which is illegal in the state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it, it was a mess, but the, it was embarrassing for them because they had to offer me the job back at the highest pay scale mm-hmm. because nobody else applied, mm-hmm. you know, at least that was qualified, you know. So so it, it's it's in dealing in conservative areas, even though California is supposedly a liberal state. I mean, the Central Valley is like the South. I mean, it's very conservative. They They rely on on uh, a workforce that's disenfranchised. They can't vote, a lot of them, because they're not citizens or so many undocumented. And so so they take advantage of that. And I think that's part of why we have some of the most conservative uh, elected officials like McCarthy, for example, mm-hmm. uh, from Bakersfield. Mm-hmm. They, they have powerful positions in, in, the, uh, in Washington's uh, because of this conservative valley within this uh, liberal state. Well, you know, it, it's very interesting because what what you're speaking to and, and what I'm hearing is two things. One is the level of sort of both political and economic polarization, right? Because mm-hmm. here you have these workers just barely, you know, getting by on the one hand, but ruled, governed by very wealthy people and our wealthy yeah. interests yeah. on the other hand. And I'm also hearing from you, one of the reasons why you were able to do what you did, aside from being a, a marvelous public health physician, is because you had that trust in the community, right? Yeah. And yeah. and how how essential that is. And and I wanted to, to ask you, sort of moving from the difficulties that you shared about trying to get what's needed, what's necessary for public health to do, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what you think a healing and truly uh, universal and, and democratic uh, public health care infrastructure would look like, you know, even thinking about it outside the bounds of, you know, the existing property relations that we have, the existing class relations that we have, you know, the existing economic system that we have that exploited those very workers, you know, I- I- at at foster farms and, you know, so many more around the country and and many lost their lives that we don't think about. We're not talking about that now. Um, How many essential workers died uh, during the pandemic? And for that matter, how many are still at risk because the the pandemic's not over, Uh, even though, you know, it's declared over. And we know, you know, that uh, vaccines alone are, are not the only layer of protection that we need to be thinking about. But you know, I I just wondered what you, what's your vision, Sal? You know, okay. having been been in the trenches around this. Okay, well, I apologize if I'm a little long winded, but uh, <laughs> vision is something very important. I I just want to preface it with that create, crisis creates opportunity for change, and and this this pandemic was a crisis for everybody, including rich people. I mean the. They because they they were a situation. I mean, they're they're vulnerable to the to COVID too. I mean, and they were some of the first ones to get vaccinated. Uh, 
uh, when, once the vaccines uh, became available. But I, I think one thing is that to, to see that uh, public health, and, and this is one of the things that we saw in the pandemic is that you can't separate health care from all the other needs people need, like food, water, shelter, uh, a loving family, uh, community that, that accepts them. All those things are very important because that was part of why people were dying. I mean, we had, I mean, Latinos in this in this valley, I mean, in, in, in general, uh, immigrants tend to, tend to do better uh, health in health indicators because they're younger when they come and they don't have all the bad habits yet that uh, people are gonna develop, <laughs> but they were crowded in living situations. And, and when we when we send somebody off, off of foster farms to say you got isolated at home, they're isolating with three generations of, of family. Right. And the ones that were dying were their, their parents or their grandparents and stuff. So we started seeing that the, uh, it's called social determinants of health. I mean, you can't separate health care from all the other basic needs of people. So those things really have to be addressed. I'm mean, having, having all, all those uh, things. You know, the pandemic showed us what can, what is possible. I mean, to, to develop a vaccine in less than a year under a crisis situation is unheard of. I mean, normally in good situations, four years or more before a vaccine becomes available. But that, that saved a lot of lives. I mean, we lost over a million lives in the United States. Worldwide, we don't know exactly how many, but some people are saying close to 20 million. Mm -hmm. um, but but it shows what's possible, but also shows uh, how people will take advantage of it. Like people became very wealthy or very rich off of this uh, situation. <laughs> and for a time being, we had homeless that were being sheltered in uh, hotels. They were uh, because uh, they were everybody was in crisis. They say, "Well, we got to get these people out of here so they don't infect everybody." They had less COVID than everybody else because they were sheltered. Mm. Shows, it shows what's possible. Mm. Uh, and then people people were getting their their stimulus checks. I mean, people were were. It, actually in a situation where, I mean, if they could do this in a crisis, get get health coverage for everybody, shelter for people that need it, income, some kind of an, an income for people, why can't they do it under uh, normal circumstances? Okay. Because yeah. we had these companies that became billionaires out of this. And, and at the same time, we had these, they showed what's possible. And now they're taking all that away. I mean, they're removing Medicaid, Medi-Cal. Uh, uh, all these hotels are being opened up by people going to Yosemite now, and, and, and the homeless are under the bridges again. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it's, it shows what's possible. What, what I also found was that, you know, one person can't do, do it all. I, 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 I'm, I'm a klutz at uh, social media, but we had people putting me on the air. I mean, people had name recognition of me just by my face. So, oh, that's so-and-so. Because they, they did it in Spanish and in English. We had uh, social media stuff to put out public messaging about mask wearing, testing, vaccinations, and all that kind of stuff. And we had community people that wanted to do stuff. We, we were able to harness it, you know, it, it, with promotoras, healthcare promoters, uh, you know, uh, promoting at the flea markets and then sending them over to me if they had a question or, or mis misconception about the vaccines and, and we worked like a team there. That's how I can work. That shows the potential of it. Right. But right. the thing is, uh, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> it's really, it's, it's something that takes team effort. Um, I encourage people to read some of the, the articles that I've done in the Tribuno, I'm, a, I'm the health desk editor, because uh, there's the same thing. We have these young women that are, I mean, they're, they're whizzes at social media and stuff. And I just did an article about the, uh, for Juneteenth on the African experience. I mean, the Underground Railroad to Mexico during, during uh, the Civil War. 
and, and they did some marvelous graphics for that you know so it's it's a, a beautiful article and so i mean i think uh uh i encourage people to look at it it's shared by the people's tribune too uh and and we encourage other people to to uh, republicize those but the vision that i have is one where we put together our knowledge as elders with the enthusiasm and and the know-how of these young people and i think we can go places Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And and thank you for, you know, continually grounding public health in the public, right? Yeah. The role of the public, the education of the public, the participation of the public, and the public, you know, uh, holding accountable uh, these these institutions um, that in so many ways have have betrayed us. Um, yeah. Whereas you know we we certainly appreciate you know what what you were able to do not only with Foster Farms, but going forward in terms of looking at how we build. I mean, I think you said it beautifully. There were parts during the pandemic that showed what was possible. Mm -hmm. And now we need to expand on that mm -hmm. and recognize that it's also necessary. Yeah, right? necessary. Yeah. I just want, I mean, I could go on with you for, for a long time. Yeah, friend. and I could go on too. I'm, I've become a blabber mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good blabber. It's a good blabber. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to to thank you so much for, for everything right. you've done and for sharing this time and i know you're still working you know full time and so we yeah. really we really appreciate your time today um thank yeah. you yeah, thank you medical Rina. student john v debache recounts her experiences entering the worlds of public health and medicine through her eyes we see the interconnectedness of abolition health and healing justice and a global vision for liberation medicine hello john v Hi, Rita. Hi, it's so nice to see you. We are so thrilled to have you here today. We're so, and I know we've had a busy week. Um, before I formally introduce you, I wanted to, to share a quote uh, from somebody I believe you admire. Um, and, and that has provided maybe some foundational uh, pieces for you. Quote. Prisons do not disappear social problems. They disappear human beings. Homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, mental illness, and illiteracy are only a few of the problems that disappear from the public view when the human beings contending with them are rele relegated to cages. That's by Angela Davis. So. And let me let me introduce you uh, to our audience. We are we are really thrilled to have you. John V is a born and raised Georgian with experience in health policy, medicine, and public health. She is a medical student and the director of the Atlanta chapter of the Campaign Against Racism, also known as CAR. She uses her abolitionist lens to identify the historical connections between white supremacy, capitalism, and racism, and imagines a future where our health systems work toward health equity. She plans to practice medicine in Georgia and hopes to open a formerly incarcerated transition clinic in our state to assist individuals who experience the carceral system. Welcome, John V. You Thank you, Rita. Like to add to that, I use she, her pronouns. So I appreciate you for that introduction and also just your, your presence and you teach me so much. I'm very excited to get a chance to just talk with you today and hopefully we learn a little bit more about each other. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, as a medical student and with a public health background, you've been deeply involved, as I mentioned, with the campaign against racism, especially the work to dismantle white supremacy and patriarchy in our medical institutions. Could you share a little bit about what that work looks like? I mean, I know we also 
work together on the Irwin County Detention Center, you know, the struggle to get that closed. And I know that you are still doing that work as a medical student within the institutions that you're working in. So I just wanted to, to ask you to share a little bit of how, how that dismantling looks. Yeah, happy to. And I think it would also be helpful to kind of add some context into how I got here and yeah. why I have the lens that I do. So as you mentioned, Rita, I'm currently a medical student, but the way that I became a medical student aligned very well with the way that I became an abolitionist. So I just wanted to keep moving upstream when it came to patient care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 10 years ago, when I thought I was interested in medicine, like I want to be a doctor to help people and started shadowing and being in clinics, I found myself getting so frustrated because the physicians were, they're great. They were seeing 20, 30 patients a day, working so hard to the point where they were missing meals, dehydrated. And I just felt like the system wasn't helpful because it just felt like a drop in a very big ocean. And the whole healthcare system felt very overwhelming to me. And so I moved what I thought upstream was, and I withdrew all my medical school applications at the time. And I enrolled in public health <laughs> um, graduate school. And I just kept asking myself, what would it take for a problem like this, whatever patient situation I was seeing to never happen again. And so in graduate school, while I was studying public health, I found myself initially very excited about the conversation of social determinants of health, mm -hmm. but then quickly felt like we weren't speaking about why those social determinants of health exist and they do because of white supremacy they do because of capitalism and they do because of our oppressive systems that continue to view whiteness and wealth over humans That's right. so i continued to move what i thought was upstream and i ended up in policy health policy and i did some state and federal level work and i found myself again so frustrated because the policy conversations just felt like such band-aid topics. We were talking about the House doing this, the Senate doing this, the Dems doing this, the Republicans doing this. And it just felt like I was being given the runaround while the corporations were benefiting constantly off our backs. So all that to say that I've now kind of come full circle and I realized that I wanted to do medical school and medicine to have a lot of tangible skills that I could give my community but I've also entered the profession now very differently than I would have 10, 10 or so years ago, because now my politic is so rooted in abolition of the prison industrial complex and the medical industrial complex. And, you know, your question, I really appreciate it because part of what this means to me is recognizing the inherent power and privilege of being in medicine and also wearing the white coat. And we talk a little bit about what wearing that white coat means and the power dynamic inside a patient room. But I think more than that, I focus on what wearing that white coat means outside of it. So we think of ourselves right in the campaign against racism as this collective of healthcare workers who globally are abolitionists and anti-capitalist. And we are using our privilege in healthcare to fight against harmful systems because that should honestly be part of the job description as a healthcare worker. So if it's okay, I'd like to give a few examples. I know you mentioned, hey, yes. yeah, I, I think for me, I get sometimes a little bit lost in the language that we end up in here in the organizing and social advocacy, social justice world, but seeing kind of concrete campaigns is very helpful. So an example for me is, was March, 2020. And as you know, and I'm sure the folks listening know, that date brings up so much, right? And during that time, my healthcare comrades and I were focused on releasing elderly and immunocompromised adults from prisons in the state of Georgia. And in March and April, hundreds of people inside facilities were testing positive for COVID. And many of these facilities became the highest infectious areas per population density in the world. Right. So through a series of open letters, through phones apps and the pressure of social media, 
we really focused our campaign towards Fulton County's district attorney. And we had a lot of different aspects to our call to action. One part of that, which remains incredibly important today, was requiring testing for everyone trafficking in and out of Fulton County jails. Because during this time, many of us on the outside, we were quarantining. We were very selective of who we want to see us, who we don't want to see. Many of us, myself included, were quarantining from loved ones, friends, family, coworkers, because we knew how important that was. Incarcerated people to this day don't have any choice in who's exposing them to viruses, including COVID. We also talked a lot about requiring the availability for soap and alcohol-based sanitizers because these supplies were, and still are sometimes, considered contraband and illegal inside these facilities. And I know you remember, Rita, we were fighting for, <laughs> for those alcohol-based hand sanitizers back then. But while the state was making this contraband, saying that incarcerated people don't deserve or don't have the right to sanitation, the state was also enforcing incarcerated people to make hand sanitizers for us on the outside. And we're paying them 65 cents an hour to manufacture. So we were also focused, and I think this is a very important part of any abolitionist lens, is thinking about what jails and prisons are near you and how do you work on closing them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a little tangential, but a lot of the folks I see in healthcare oftentimes are transplants to a city, right? And this kind of works for all graduate programs and upper level training programs. People end up in places where they might not have grown up or they might not have community. And it can feel really overwhelming on how do you now make community when you're only here for a short period of time. And if you're an abolitionist, you know, that can be your politic, but what are you doing? It can feel really hard to find out how, right? Um, and so I think a really easy way to do that is just to find the, the jails and prisons near where you live and then find out what campaigns there are to close them and then get involved with those campaigns. So part of our campaign back in March 2020 was fighting for the closure of Union City Jail because it was a really condemned building with deplorable and really unhealthy living conditions. Another part of this was to provide free phone calls and video calls to individuals who were in prison or jail until they were released because in-person visitation was suspended at this time. And the mental health aspect and the trauma aspect of being isolated while the rest of the world on the outside is craving information. I know I was doom scrolling on all social media back then because I just wanted to know the latest updates, know how to keep myself safe, my family safe. And at the same time, folks on the inside are having to pay to make phone calls to family members and can't even see them anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So simultaneously to this open letter that we're writing and the social media campaign and the phone zaps, we were working on creating this resource guide of all the places that folks who were previously incarcerated could be housed and fed and could find employment and get free health care upon release. Because we can't just fight for release of folks and then let them come outside and not give them anything else, right? That's what That's the right. state already does, right? <laughs> so we have to so step They it got up. there in the first place, right? <laughs> exactly. And all of these resources were impossible to find early pandemic. People already didn't want to take in newer people just because of COVID. And then you also tack on the fact that these are formerly incarcerated people and the bureaucracy was really showing herself. And I think in that moment, I started to realize that the nonprofit industrial complex cannot give us the solutions we need. The state as it exists today cannot give us the solutions we need. And jail and prisons during a pandemic are essentially a death sentence. That That is so profound and so appreciative of you sharing that personal experience. I mean, we saw, you know, just to underscore what you're saying, we saw during the pandemic where jails were jails and poultry plot processing plants and meat packing plants were centers uh, for for the pandemic, were centers 
to to spread uh, COVID throughout the community and really became exposed the the policy of the state, which essentially said there's a whole grouping of people that are disposable, right? Um, mm-hmm. That don't need our protection and that don't need uh, the the necessities of life in order to you know in order not only to survive but to actually thrive. And so I see in your work, um, you know, this as you sort of uncovered the artichoke of your own experiences in terms of medicine, public health, and the prison and jail system, that uh, you're striving to expose the harms and the root causes of mass incarceration and fighting to center those that are, quote unquote, most marginalized uh, by the state who are deemed uh, less than um, and understanding at the same time the kind of privilege that healthcare professionals, the the authority of the white coat, but creating that alignment between the skills that we have as nurses and docs and and healthcare providers with centering on the needs of the people that are experiencing the most brutal arms of this state. And I wanted to to ask you uh, a little bit, I mean, I think you shared it brilliantly through your own experience, but the meaning of being both an abolitionist and a health and healing justice leader, because I know abolition isn't only about abolishing a carceral system. It's also about a vision of what's actually possible and necessary. Do you want to share some of your thoughts on that? Oh my gosh. I have so many thoughts for you now, Rita. Yes. (laughs) I think a really helpful way to frame all of what you just discussed is our campaign to shut down Irwin County Detention Center here in Georgia. Mm-hmm. And I know personally, that's where I feel like you and I, Rita, got to connect a lot and build together and grow together and really exist as comrades in the space. Right. And so I'll give a little summary of this effort. But as many of you know, Don Wooten was the nurse who blew the whistle on the forced gynecological procedures and medical abuses that were happening to immigrant women who were detained at Irwin County Detention Center. And it was a physician that was responsible for the sterilization abuse on these vulnerable patients. And it had been reported that these abuses had been going back more than 20 years in different forms. So why was he allowed to continue practice? Why did we decide that incarcerated people get disposed of? Why did we decide that they don't deserve quality care? So. Our campaign called for the immediate shutdown of Irwin County ICE Detention Center. It called for transformative justice and reparations, and it called for the release of all of those who were detained. Because this was the medical industrial complex in full effect, right? We had forced sterilizations, we had gender-based violence, medical violence, and these were all being perpetuated at the expense of mostly black migrant women. And it was imperial during the pandemic, too, right? Exactly. And it was because of neoliberalism and imperialism that they were violently being forced into this migration in the first place. And I remember at that time reading this AJC article called Closing an ICE Detention Center in South Georgia would cheer activists but harm a rural community's economy. (laughs) And It just made me think about how we've made our poorest people so reliant on the medical industrial complex that the question becomes, do we continue the ICE detention center that's actively abusing people to keep our local economy going? And that just even sounds ridiculous to say. So to get to the other part of your question, you're right, abolition of prisons and jails and our carceral system is one part of abolition. But to me, an even more important part is an end to American imperialism because our country has harmed the entire planet. And I recognize this through the lens of health because even if tomorrow, somehow in the US, we manage to adopt a phenomenal Medicare for all plan, the imperialistic practices of America are gonna continue to destroy the health of adults and children globally. 
right? Like our U.S. military has created areas like Fallujah who have some of the highest birth defects, congenital defects in children. Our military's sanctions continue to starve Cuba. They continue to starve Afghanistan. The military's greenhouse gas emissions lead to more displaced people without stable housing. We extinguish homeland through war or extrapolate the resources of entire nations. And if you look at this through a trauma lens, the U.S. military is constantly causing trauma. And it was actually the fact that a lot of my work and interest in abolition of the carceral system was through broadly recognizing the destruction of the U.S. military. And I started looking at this through adverse childhood experiences because when we decide that we want to move upstream, that we want to focus on future generations, that we want to start to end some of the traumas that our kids are facing, that later our adults face, and our older adults end up facing, we have to look at the common factor of all of these traumas, whether it's in the United States or abroad, all of them stem from the impacts of these harmful systems such as capitalism and imperialism and the patriarchy and our carceral state, which to me feels very congruent to what I was noticing with the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So it felt like a full circle moment because I kept coming back to this. I kept saying that the structures that exist in public health aren't enough. Mm -hmm. And if we want to move upstream, we have to recognize that our problems lay in our social structure and in racial capitalism. I really, I really appreciate that. I, I especially appreciate your bringing in the international perspective, right? Because when we were talking about the Irwin County Detention Center, the, those migrations are forced migrations, forced migrations from climate crisis, losing, uh, losing the ability to sustain yourself through local farming when droughts or floods have wiped out the conditions that you, you know, historically uh, had been able to sustain yourself with. Or as you mentioned, just the violence of the military internationally and the amount of money that we send to the military every year and how that could be used instead to house the homeless, right? To, to provide actually a public health infrastructure that's community rooted, scientifically rigorous, and actually trusted by the community because it comes from what the community's needs are, not what perceived needs of the economics of society are, which is often the role that public health has played within this country, right? Public health to ensure a productive workforce or if uh, uh, if less workers are needed or populations are deemed uh, superfluous to productivity, then witness sterilization, mass incarceration, and, and that kind of violence perpetuated, right? So to actually have a vision about doing, doing things differently by building the kind of relationships that I see that you've built through CAR, the way that you have centered uh, folks that have that are formerly incarcerated in your work, that is so critical, I think, to providing leadership for our future uh, healthcare practitioners, right? Because if you if you are exposed to a toxic environment, a toxic educational environment, how are you going to provide a nurturing environment uh, for the patients that you're trying to care for? Exactly. And I think, of course, I'm reading Kara Page's book right now and Erica Woodland's yeah. book on healing, healing lineages. And I think it's really helping me realize that a lot of the times as healthcare workers, we're experiencing a collective trauma and it cannot be wellness out we cannot do enough we can do a wellness module every day you know and it still won't be enough because of the grief that we're experiencing because as healthcare workers we see the downstream effects of every failed social system and it's exhausting and i mean that in an emotional sense and all, but also a physical sense that, that's right and also, I'll say that in my view, 
if your profession is focused on health and health outcomes, you are inherently in a political role. Mm. And I think sometimes this goes a little bit too much out of the picture because folks like to think I'm in medicine, I'm in public health. This is apolitical. You know, I just want to do good. But in public health, the entire field is focused on allocation of resources, which is incredibly political. And not only that, but our politics should be one that constantly confronts white supremacy and the many ways that it takes shape, including the carceral system. There are so many other ways to take shape. And I always encourage folks to recognize that there are so many ways that white supremacy takes shapes. And we've talked about some of them today, whether it be the environment, reproductive justice, the carceral system, food justice, disability justice, gender-based violence. And it feels overwhelming, at least sometimes to me, to think of, I can't do all of that by myself. And I care about all those issues equally, you know? And that's where I found myself initially feeling very overwhelmed, especially when you constantly have the ongoing climate crisis. We're living in late stage capitalism. It just feels like too much sometimes. But I think what's really helped me is grounding myself in community, grounding myself in mutual aid, letting medicine be a part of who I am, but not defining what I do or who I am in a space of community. And I just feel like that has made going through the uphill battle of medical education feel a lot more doable for me. And with all of these overlapping issues, I think it's become very important to recognize that we're all fighting the same root cause. And that is white supremacy and racial capitalism. And these are all just the different ways that it's taking shape in our lives. And we all have to be working on these issues separately, but also together, recognizing that we cannot do this work in silos. And that's always feels really important. And for me, I think I've taken the avenue of fighting the carceral system, but I support my comrades in every other space as equally as they support me in this space. I really appreciate that. Um, This, what I am seeing is extremely exciting in terms of a convergence, a breaking down of silos and an understanding that we do have root causes and private property and capitalism and its imperialist expression is a root cause, right? That white supremacy is a weapon that's used to keep us divided, to to create structures that inherently uh, promote inequity within every system that we exist in. And the beginnings of sharing those kinds of root causes also leads to the conversations about if we could do it another way, what would we what would it look like? What would it look like thinking outside of the box of the structures that currently oppress and exploit us and creating another way of being uh and you know we've often said on these podcasts a little bit another world is possible and now i think we also know that another world is absolutely necessary and i think that that your strategic view of not only healthcare but how healthcare and the medical industrial complex fits within broader uh structures of society um is is the fighting upstream is the upstream that you're achieving. And I'm so thrilled. I'm just so thrilled to know you, to work with you, and to know that, you know, the future really is up to us. And when I look at somebody who's a little bit younger than I am, it (laughs) thrills me with with confidence. And we could go on, I think, for a, a lot longer. But I'd like to ask you, Do you have any last words to share with us today, knowing that this is just a part of an ongoing process to disrupt, to make the leap from the way that things are today to the way that things can actually be? We can vision this because they're really possible for the first time in human history. No, that's all so beautiful. And thank you so much, Rita, for allowing me to get a chance to chat with you more than anything. (laughs) I think the way I want to approach your question is looking big picture in and 
a few things I think we have to change at a big picture level. And that is recognizing that health is a social good and not a market good and that you cannot profit over people's sickness. There you go. We have to acknowledge that hospitals and medical centers are part of the medical industrial complex and see the ways that the MIC and the prison industrial complex influence each other. We have to redefine wellness, value, worthiness, because our current definitions in medicine are ableist and they're based off white supremacist and heteropatriarchal ideas. So this is kind of a big culture and policy change and it includes systemic labor laws. It includes an end to U.S. imperialism. It includes a removal of racial capitalism from our society. And that feels very overwhelming, right? But when you look even smaller, and I think for me, where I see myself a lot of the day to day is kind of in a clinic room, there needs to be more liberated medical care. And I look to street medics for this because I feel like they do this best where they put patient autonomy first. And they recognize that patients know their body the best because white supremacy shields us from really seeing our patients as visible in their own struggles. And I think that's just a very easy way that even today, someone that might be listening can start to think about how in their day-to-day life, we can focus ourselves and ground ourselves in true patient care, which is a very liberated patient care, which is a very autonomous patient care. And it can feel easy to get lost in all of this. So what I had to do is give myself short-term goals and long-term goals, right? Like the long-term goal is abolition. And the short-term goal is volunteering in the prisons and jails, having inside-outside communication, making sure that my friends on the inside are aware of what's happening on the outside. They know what Cop City looks like. They know what the carceral state is doing. They have resources for when they come out. How are they going to reintegrate into society after so many years for a lot of folks? And at the same time, my friends on the outside, my comrades here, my healthcare workers, they know what the carceral state is doing. They know how deplorable the conditions in prisons and jails are. And they know that in order for us on the inside and the outside to truly be liberated, there has to be an end to the carceral state, the medical industrial complex and the prison industrial complex. Well, you just tied it up. You just put the bow <laughs> on it. And you're you're also setting the basis to for people to have a discussion about what liberated healthcare looks like. And that's really important, you know, in terms of not only the day-to-day practice, but from that practice, being able to to get to the other side of the very big picture because we we can't concede any battlefield. And in the process of those struggles, we begin to develop the kind of, the kind of vision and the kind of infrastructures that we actually need for, and I'm going to close it out with your words, liberated medical care, liberated health care. I love it. I absolutely love it. John, we we could go on. Um, We could, and we will go on together. We will. We will. We have our whole lives, Rita. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today and for your work every day. We we love you and we appreciate you so very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Always a privilege. Our privilege. Take care.